Welcome back, everybody, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. As always, you can support this work by subscribing to aksum.substack.com. That's A-K-S-U-M.substack.com. You could also head over to patreon.com slash tawahado. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash T-E. W-A-H-I-D-O. My guest today is Dr. Benjamin Studebaker. He's a political theorist from the University of Cambridge. How are you doing today? I'm great. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you for coming. So there are so many different um, big ideas you have put out there into the political universe that I would love to to hear your thoughts. And I think my audience would benefit from getting this perspective that, that frankly, I think they don't get to hear that often. Uh, the biggest idea is probably a left-wing argument against Biden, which on its face is, I think, very counterintuitive to a lot of people, but I think it's very tactful, uh, very tactical and very strategy-based. Uh, but before we get there, h- how did you get into <clears throat> political theory and you know, up to the point of uh, uh, getting as credentialed and, and degreed as you? And is there a reason why you frame things in terms of political theory rather than political science? Well, uh, I'm from Indiana originally. I started getting into politics when I was eight years old, watching the Gore Bush election in 2000. So I'm 28, but I've I've been watching longer than most 28 year olds. Yeah. I knew I wanted to do something political. The discipline, I wasn't quite clear to me for a while, but I knew I wanted to do something politics, history, social studies, something like that from a very early age. I got to the end of high school. I went, all I want to do is this stuff. I don't want to do any, anything else. I don't want gen eds. I, I need specialization. So I went to Britain, uh, to the University of Warwick for undergrad, where I did just three years straight politics. And during Mm -hmm. that, I found that I'm really most attracted to theory and conceptual systems. That's what I'm most into. I'm not into interviewing. I'm not into polling. I'm not into making big quantitative data sets. Uh, I can read that stuff, and I find it interesting to read sometimes, but mainly for the purposes of theorizing about it. So it became very clear to me that theory was my subfield and I was gonna read about conceptual systems. I went to University of Chicago for my master's and then came to Cambridge for the PhD where I did a PhD on democracy and legitimacy and how those things interface with economic inequality. And for me, theory is, is wide open in a way that empirical work isn't. There are all kinds of rules with empirical work, all kinds of rules about what exactly you have to do. And every different kind of empirical method has a lot of rules, rules, rules. (laughs) Theory is more wide open and you could pull together lots of different things. You can take stuff from lots of different places. You can be a little bit more eclectic. That's right. Yeah, I I appreciate that. Um, I have basically been in that world, the same world as you. Uh, my first political memory, I'm a couple years older than you. My first political memory was uh, uh, being embarrassed in class because my mom would tell me that Bill Clinton was her friend. And I took that at face value. And I was telling people, oh, Bill Clinton, that's my mom's friend. Uh, and uh, I do remember doing a mock election uh, when I was in fifth grade of the um, Al Gore Bush too. <laughs> so uh, very close. We're very, we're very close into kind of a political alignment there. And I basically studied theory too. Undergrad was uh, at Pepperdine in Los Angeles. And I studied political science and was kind of viewing things similar to you. But I didn't even think about applying all the way to a PhD till now. And, and I've been more interested in the quantitative stuff just to round myself out. But if I'm being honest, I, I've, I've delved into theory mostly, especially when I was in, in uh, university debate circles. I know people are getting used to quoting Zizek and uh, Foucault now, but you know I was hearing these names back in uh, 2010 and 2011. So it's, it's fascinating seeing things beginning in uh, academe and then and spreading to you know, whether people have read these people or not, just uh, name dropping them in in conversations. So th- thank you for, for giving us that kind of intro to how you got into that. Um, now, 
before we get into your left wing argument against Biden, one of the things that I think, uh, and this is good because this is a, a nice theoretical framework. One of the things that I see most often is inconsistent usage of words like left and right, liberal, progressive, conservative, neoconservative, neoliberal, anarchist, tanky, social. I mean, uh, I don't want to overwhelm you, but I imagine you're familiar with most, if not all of these terms. I I typically go back to the the etymological and historical setting of the French assembly, but I don't think everybody quite does that. I, what is your understanding of the words used? And if you could give us any figures of like, where would you place, uh, you know, certain figures? Because the reason I say it is, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, uh, and Stalin, you know, <laughs> are all called left. Uh, I'm not sure they're all in the same exact uh, category, but may maybe they are. So uh, any take on that? And if you could put any figures uh, behind the categories. Yeah, I, a lot of stuff gets conflated together under the terms left and right. For me, it comes down to a fundamental difference in whether you think about the world as composed of individuals or is composed of structures and systems. So is the mm -hmm. individual constructed by structures and systems, states, civil society organizations, the family, different institutions that create incentives, but also create, uh, encourage different drives in people, encourage people to value different things. Is the individual the product of systems or are systems the products of individuals where individuals are given a kind of pre-political essence that is fixed that they bring into politics. And then politics is the result of those distinct individual essences bouncing off each other. The way that I like to make the cut is that left-wingers of all sorts of different stripes think that systems construct individuals and right-wingers think that individuals construct systems. That's how I make that cut. A lot of other people don't make the cut in that way and mm. prefer to talk about particular policy positions that people take. Yeah. But in practice, there are lots of different combinations of policy positions people can have for all sorts of different reasons. I think the difference is more fundamental, and it comes down to whether you feel that individuals who are not doing well have been in some way hurt by a structure or a system that's not serving them, or whether you think those individuals are kind of fundamentally bad on some level or fundamentally need to get good or take personal responsibility, get a job, educate themselves. And that's an area where I think that there's a lot of conflation. A lot of people who think of themselves as on the left will say things like educate yourself, but mm -hmm. educate yourself is the same thing as get a job. It's the <laughs> same thing. It's saying that the individual has to take care of the problem. The problem is in the individual. So to me, that's a right wing thought, even though a lot of people who think of themselves as left wing have that thought. And for that reason, I tend to associate left and right with ideas or ways of thinking rather than people, because I think we all have mm -hmm. some of this structure and some of this individual system going in our heads at the, at the same time. And at any given moment, a person might express a left wing idea or a right wing idea, but that doesn't make people fundamentally essentially left wing or right wing. Some people are more likely or have a greater tendency to be consistent because they've studied the stuff and tried to make a point to be consistent. But most people are ideologically inconsistent and don't occupy a fixed <laughs> space. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was going to say that because, you know, I've always uh, I've, I've felt like the the odd man out in uh, in many different um, circles. My parents are Ethiopian immigrants. And to them, you know. The, the biggest insult they would ever throw at me is they would call me a foreigner, which I always thought was funny being born here. Uh, and then, you know, to my American friends, because I picked up so much of my parents' uh, habits, they considered me too Ethiopian. The, even the Ethiopian Americans who were more assimilated and who knew less of their culture, um, obviously the police are going to treat me just like any other black man, they're not going to make that sort of distinction. <laughs> um, and then, you know, various white people and black people will say, oh, well, you're African, not black. And that distinction, I think, um, I think there is some value to it, especially most recently around some of the reparations discussions and people coming up with the term uh, ADOS, the African descendants of slaves. 
And, and uh, you know, one commentator, at least, that I heard made a, an interesting comment about both Kamala Harris and Barack Obama, you know, one being an actual president and one being a potential president of the United States, none of which come from those direct populations in which the federal government actually, the systems, using the systems thinking you're talking about, actually perpetrated uh, systemic harm against and and that was an interesting thing to think about. So I, I think there's some value there. But that's interesting because, you know, I threw this term at you when we were emailing, kind of sent this up that my friend made up, and I've seen James Altucker talk about too, uh, alt centrism. Because in a sense, uh, when you describe both of those things, systems thinking and individual, I don't know if I'm I'm weird or if I'm more common, but I I I tend to see kind of uh, both sides, if that makes sense, and you know so. That sounds like it would make me a centrist under your paradigm, but I'm certainly not a centrist in the mold of the Clintons and the Bushes and uh, you know Biden and and Kamala and all that, uh, because it's it, rather than pulling from the slightly left wing and the slightly right wing, I think I would be pulling from the extreme right wing and the extreme left wing, and so I don't I don't know if that creates a a different space under your paradigm, but but that's helpful that the paradigm itself doesn't say pick people because it, it's very functional. I've seen a lot of functionality actually in, in your thinking. I, I read your piece about, um, and this will be, a, I think, a good segue to getting into the presidential election, uh, the idea of red states and blue states. We, we've seen uh, Trump and Biden talking about that in different ways. They exist. You make a case for left-wing people running in the Republican Party, I, I'm sure that would cause a lot of people to anathematize you, uh, because it's un, it's unthinkable. Some of the scenarios I think about are the pro-life women who were kicked out of the Women's March in D.C. because they aligned with all the economic interests, but that one kind of cultural social position was seen as a, a non-starter, like a, a, a deal breaker. So can you talk to us a little bit about your left-wing strategy for states, and then we could get into the presidential stuff? Yeah, so if you look at red states, a lot of red states at this point have state legislatures that are overwhelmingly Republican, which means even if you, as a left-wing person, run, get the Democratic Party's primary nomination and somehow win the general election against the Republican, you then come into a state legislature and you have no influence, no opportunity to propose legislation and nobody will talk to you. So you don't get anything done and that causes everybody at home to think that you're just another politician. Uh, and since you're not getting any money because you're left wing and nobody's just going to throw money at you to keep running, you probably won't last very long. Uh, the fundraising mechanisms for Democratic parties in red states are very weak. So even if you then try to act centrist to stay in office, there just isn't that much money for you because the Democratic Party is weak in the state. So you could go to all this trouble. You can, as a left winger, run in the Democratic primary, run a good campaign, get run in the general as a Democrat even win the election. You're not going to make a lot of progress or create a lot of confidence in leftism in a red state doing that because there's no opportunity to actually do anything concrete for people. And the suspicion that ordinary people in red states have of Democrats is that they're not going to do anything for them. They're not going to help them and that they have contempt for them culturally. Mm -hmm. right? And this is fed by a lot of Democrats in red states don't really like the fact that they live in red states. They, they don't like their state. They make fun of their state all the time. They're kind of contemptuous of their neighbors, the people around them. And if you don't like the people around you, then you try to run for office. Why are they going to vote for you? They can tell that you don't like them, that you don't think that their religious values or their family values are cool or okay. Mm -hmm. So they're suspicious of you. And if you're going, well, I'm going to get you Medicare for all, or I'm going to get you a jobs program, or I'm going to build infrastructure in the town. You have to deliver on that, or they're going to go, why am I voting for someone who looks down on me and doesn't do anything for me? And because of the way state legislatures are set up in red states, it's very hard to accomplish anything as a Democrat in a red state. And you have the added baggage of all of this cultural perception, even if you individually try to come off as non-judgmental. Because you're running as a Democrat and the Democrats are associated with this judgmental attitude, you're going to get put in that box and your Republican opponent is going to try to put you in that box. 
And you're going to have to deal with the national reputation of people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who is constantly making people in your red state feel like people on the left don't like them, don't care about them, and, and don't respect them. So you, you, there isn't really a functional strategy for running as a Democrat in the way that they might do in New York or mm -hmm. the Bay Area. That's not to say that in the New York and the Bay Area, you shouldn't run as a Democrat. In those areas, you'd be foolish to run as a Republican because you would never get off the ground as a Republican. But I think in different places, we should be flexible about what party we use because in the United States, the parties are really empty suits. Yep. Since the reforms that turned it into a primary structure, the party elites don't have that much control over who runs in the parties, especially in the down ballot races where the often the local committees are very flimsy in their ability to check people and check their backgrounds. They don't really know what's going on. And if you can get people to vote for you, you can advance in the party structure pretty much no matter what you believe. So given that American parties are like that, there's no reason not to use both parties. There's no reason to just have an inherent anathema to this party on the basis of who currently is in it. Once upon a time, Theodore Roosevelt was a Republican and the Democrats mm -hmm. were the segregationists. There's no reason that you can't realign these things and change them. We have to think a little bigger. Yeah, I, I really I really appreciate that argument. Not too long ago, I was, I was reading actually a more quantitative uh, uh, political graduate named David Shore. I don't know if you're familiar with him. And, and he's made similar arguments to you. So it's funny that on the theory side, on the qualitative side and on the quant side, there are similar arguments being made. And he he caught a lot of, of flack. Uh, he even, you know, it's it's arguable <laughs> whether or not he lost his job because of it. But, but certainly he made statements even about the idea of uh, nonviolence and trying to minimize looting uh, versus, you know, of course, the people who are writing in defense of of looting but but on this subject too of of winning in red states he had the same view as you and i i love it because it's it's contextual you're not saying be republican all the time you're saying when it suits the interest the economic interests that you are trying to get enacted if you really care about you know medicare for all even on a state level uh, to prepare for, you know, a national level or, or whatever it may be, you know, worker safety, what, whatever you're trying to get that if you actually care about winning more than converting someone, then this is one tactic you can use. Uh, there's, a, an, an anarchist, uh, was he self-identified as an anarchist? Although I've, I think, uh, I think right wing is, is probably where he would fit under, under his own paradigm and under the paradigm you, you set, uh, Michael Malice who he often says and views some of the elites in the party as desiring complete and total you know ideological submission whereas the kind of vision you're painting is far more diverse it's not just contextual it seems like you're comfortable with diversity and uh, we're talking a little bit about this off camera but you may find this a funny analogy but i see a similarity between you and uh, Jack Dorsey of Twitter and Cash App, and Emma Green, who's a religion writer at The Atlantic. Emma Green grew up in Tennessee. Jack grew up in Missouri. You grew up in Indiana. And what's what's funny about this is, uh, you know, I think some of those may swing occasionally, uh, but generally speaking, you all grew up around conservatives. And and yet, uh, or let's say right wingers, and yet you are each of you left wing, and there's a certain amount where uh, to, to to say what you were saying earlier, you won't dehumanize and demonize people who are your first cousins, second cousins, neighbors, people you have to actually see. It, it seems like this this idea of the echo chamber, which was much talked about in 2016, when people were caught off guard, they're like, it's unfathomable. How can people, you know, vote for Trump? Uh, it's because they they formed bubbles. I myself grew up, I would say, in a left wing bubble until college. I met the first right wingers ever because Pepperdine is interesting. It's a liberal arts college, so it is in California. It is in Los Angeles. It is the most liberal of conservative schools, but it's still a conservative school. 
And, and that's a funny dynamic to be the most liberal conservative school because it pisses off the conservatives who come from Arkansas and Texas. It's not right wing enough for them. And then it, it makes the, the people who grew up in LA and, and the Bay Area and wherever else they came from mad that it's too right wing. So I, I, I wonder, do you, do you think that this idea of growing up in Indiana shaped your view? And uh, what, what, if anything, uh, being in the UK, did the UK affect that at all? I don't know if you were around right wingers there too. Yeah, I've been in and out of, I've been hopping back and forth between the two countries for about 10 years now. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that being transatlantic in this way has had an effect on me. When I first came to the UK, when I, I uh, first came over to undergrad, I was like a lot of people from red states who then go to college somewhere, uh, even if it's in the United States. Uh, oh, I'm around all of these people who are liberal and progressive and isn't this cool. And there's a period where you go, well, isn't this cool? Isn't this cool? And during that period, you tend to look down on home and the home culture. And you know, if I introduce myself to someone in Britain, I don't say I'm from in Indiana. I would say I'm from Chicago. <laughs> you, you, try to, you try to play yeah. it up that way, right? That's the first stage. Now, the second stage is to get to a point where you start to realize, hey, there are some issues with the way things are done out here too. And actually there are just as many issues as mm -hmm. there are at home. They're just a little different. You didn't see them initially because you're not used to them. So by the time I got to the end of my time at Warwick, I was kind of sick of the Brits and all their austerity. And I went, you know, they have a national health service, but they're just as stupid about their contemporary discussions as we are at home. I got a little homesick. So I went back to Chicago, to the University of Chicago. Now at the University yeah. of Chicago, yeah, there I'm going, okay, I'm back in the United States, but now I'm feeling like I'm from Indiana because I'm in Chicago and I'm not from Chicago, I'm from Indiana. And mm -hmm. I'm noticing you know, uh, Chicago, you know, I like Chicago, but a lot of yuppies in Chicago. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people who are focusing on their careers and not on yep. people and, and you know people who need help. So I'm yeah, I start getting a little bit tired of that. Uh, so then I have a, a year in between where I'm applying for PhDs where I'm in Indiana. And initially I come back to Indiana. Oh, it's nice to be back in Indiana. And after about a year of that, I go, oh, I really got to get out of Indiana. I need to have more intellectual conversations. So I run yeah. off to Cambridge, right? So I come to Cambridge in 2015, just in time for the 2016 election. And during that period, I'm surrounded by Cambridge people who have uh, no real ability to understand why Trumpism is a thing or why it's popular <laughs> or what's appealing about it and yeah. who are just heavily, heavily denigrating red state people all the time. A lot of them, mm -hmm. are. not everybody. I mean, people are trying, but it's what tends to happen. Just as in the red states, people tend to denigrate the blue states. In the more elite areas, people tend to denigrate the red areas. It's just what people do when they're in bubbles. But because I mm -hmm. hop back and forth, I don't do it as much. Yeah. So. I spent enough time over there during that to kind of solidify a position, which is you know, people from my home state are human beings and they deserve to not be exploited too. And the fact that they might be Christian or the fact that they might be straight or white or male or whatever, uh, doesn't mean that they also are not part of an argument that exploitation is not okay, that worker exploitation is not okay. And there's no reason that we should be kicking them out or not including them. And the decision not to include them is what led to Trump. The decision under the Obama administration to neglect rural areas and neglect people who didn't have college degrees. If you look at the map of counties where there was negative job growth during the Obama recovery, that map very neatly corresponds to the map of counties that Trump won. And if we're going to keep neglecting people and neglecting their needs, and we're going to tell them that they're bad people for failing to vote Democrat, well, they're not going to like that. They're going to respond very poorly to that. And I'm left wing. I don't view it as their fault that they're Trump mm -hmm. voters or their fault that they feel resentful or their fault that they're taking that resentment out in lots of different ways. I'm going, what have we done to these people structurally to cause them to vote like this? to cause them to behave this way. What's our system doing? And what it's doing is it's impoverishing these areas. It's, it's economically strangling rural red states. It's economically strangling people who don't have college degrees. Those are the two real categories, people who didn't go to college and people who live in rural areas. Those people are really getting strangled and have been increasingly for 40 years now. And they vote, they, you know, Indiana was a blue state in 2008. It voted for Barack Obama in 2008. 
and you didn't do very much for many people living in the state, and they are upset about that, mm -hmm. and they're entitled to be upset about it. Now, if Donald Trump comes along and says he's going to do this, that, and the other, uh, he can't deliver the things that he's talking about doing because there are political economy issues with Trumpism. But I recognize that if you have not been treated as someone who matters, you're going to find that message of the forgotten men and women of our country uh, very resonating. And until we find a way to present a message to people that doesn't condescend to them and which administers to their feeling of being left out, we're going to keep losing these areas. And because you need an incredible number of senators to pass Medicare for all at the national level, uh, and there are an incredible number of low population red states, you're not going to have enough senators to pass Medicare for all until we find a way to talk to these people. So I'm, I'm not impressed by electoral success that occurs in areas that were previously won by Nancy Pelosi type Democrats. Mm -hmm. I, until somebody is able to find a way to get senators in these red states, we're just not going to get anywhere. Yeah, it's, it's very fascinating how your systems thinking kind of takes away the blame and the shame that we that we often see for example uh i hate to even insert it into our dialogue now because it almost sullies it but the stark contrast of the way you're saying it versus the way other people uh compels me to ask for example you you don't bring into this conversation at all like words like racism and white supremacy because these are these are words that that i hear a lot in terms of uh, being given explanatory power for those large swaths of, of people that you said? Well, I don't know if you ever saw this old movie, The Land Before Time 3. Have you ever seen The Land Before Time is, 3? Is that the dinosaur cartoon movie? Yeah, the dinosaur cartoon movie. You know, in, yeah. in Land Before Time 3, there's a drought. Uh, the, the water stops coming. They have a stream that feeds their watering hole, and the stream, for some reason, stops flowing, and they don't have enough water. And once they don't have enough water, suddenly all the species of dinosaurs start turning on each other and going, you're a water waster. And, <laughs> and you don't, you, you, you use water all the time. It, it's your kind that wastes water. And they all turn on each other and form groups once there is a shortage and they're scared. Once they're not okay materially, they all turn on each other culturally and they all get really mad at each other. And, you know, one of the dinosaurs who's a, vi the, uh, Daddy Tops, the big Triceratops, he's the one who's mm -hmm. the most scared and most upset. And he blames the long necks for everything, <laughs> right? But Littlefoot, the little long neck dinosaur, he doesn't have an animus toward the big Triceratops because he understands that he's just scared. He mm -hmm. understands that. Littlefoot understands that, but many people in our discourse don't understand that people are just afraid because they're not doing okay. And they're looking for someone to blame or something to blame because they're not okay. And the solution to that problem is to make people materially okay, to take away the cause of fear, the real cause of fear, not the thing that they happen to have attached it to. That, <laughs> that hit so well. It's funny, I didn't know where you're going with this at first, but this is how I know we're part of the same milieu because I, I knew exactly that movie. And to this day, I forget her name, but the little yellow dinosaur, she always said, yup, yup. I say yup, yup to this day because of that movie. Uh, so that that illustration really hit home, and that that's so right. If uh, you know, people often talk in terms of uh, Maslow's uh, law of hierarchy. Uh, if their needs, if their economic and financial needs aren't being met, that underlying interest will manifest in other ways that you think, if you pull those things away, would not uh, be as manifest. I I I've heard similar. Um, arguments about U.S. foreign policy, uh, especially when people discuss, you know, the, the varying types of Islam and the, the very real blowback of, of U.S. foreign policy that has, that has caused that, whereas people think that, you know, this is, you know, especially recently with like the, the beheadings that have been going on in, in, in France, which are obviously very horrendous and, and, and jarring, but we can't pretend as if the nation states foreign policies have nothing to do with creating these these systems or the these pools where these cesspools really where where these type of ideas will will fester and and manifest that that was great thank you so now moving on to the the kind of big idea 
of a left-wing argument against Biden. Now, this goes back to what I was saying. The podcast I heard where I found you was uh, on Current Affairs with you and your friend Nathan Robinson. And one of the, the very interesting things about the conversation is he was extremely, I don't want to say you are not passionate, but he was extremely uh, passionate in his expression of uh, of sounding the alarm of how how quintessential it is to get Biden elected in 2020. And uh, ostensibly, I don't know, I, I imagine there's some things you may disagree on, but it seems like for the most part, you agree on things and you say, no, well, uh, maybe Biden should take an L this time. I've seen uh, uh, Brianna Joy Gray take a lot of flack on Twitter. I've seen uh, Glenn Greenwald recently resign from The Intercept, which he helped found with Jeremy Scahill and, and Laura Poitras, the three of whom for um, you know Dirty Wars and Blackwater and Citizen Four with Edward Snowden. And, and, and uh, I, I actually used to work for Dennis Kucinich back in 2011, and I was uh, running Glenn's old Portugal drug study <laughs> to show how they did drug uh, decriminalization in, in, in Portugal and, and running that you know, to, to Dennis. But all these people, including you, seem to be at least skeptical and you stopped short on the podcast from telling people to you know vote for Trump instead and and I don't think you would say that um but I'm interested to hear that argument and uh would you set, suggest left wingers vote green party or sit out or 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 vote Trump or how, tell tell us your pitch for the left wing argument against Biden and and what if anything you would tell voters well if you look at the last 40 years of the country, the kind of post-1980 uh, era, we've gradually gotten more and more economic inequality, more and more precarity and instability in people's lives. And this has occurred under both Democrats and Republicans. If you look, every, Democrat, every president, Democrat or Republican, starting with Jimmy Carter, has seen an expansion of economic inequality with more and more of the national income going to the top 1%. Every president, either party. Prior to Jimmy Carter, starting with Herbert Hoover and ending with Ford, every president, Democrat or Republican, saw a reduction. So what we really have here is an era. It's not a party that's the bad party. It's an era in which we have a kind of, ec of economic system that we've adopted that gradually makes the level of stress on people higher and higher over time. And the more stress people are under, the more weird and bizarre and over-the-top reactions we're going to have on all sides, everybody's gonna be more emotionally worked up because everybody's under more stress, right? So the, the thing to bear in mind is that very often the Democrat does something which creates the window for the Republican and for further movement to the right. So if it, mm -hmm. we can even go back to Lyndon Johnson, right? Lyndon Johnson has to go into Vietnam and escalate Vietnam because in the 50s, everybody accused the Democrats of being soft on communism. And Lyndon Johnson is afraid to look soft on communism. So he has to stay in Vietnam. He has to escalate Vietnam, right? Now, Nixon runs against Johnson going, oh, he can't handle Vietnam. He's terrible on Vietnam. We need peace with honor in Vietnam, right? So Nixon runs on that. And then when he gets in, he bombs Cambodia and he does more terrible, horrible things that nobody thought they were voting for when they voted for Nixon. So the Republican is able to run against the Democrats' right wing stuff and then use that to create space for more right wing stuff. I'll give you another example. Jimmy Carter appoints Paul Volcker, chairman of the Federal Reserve. Paul Volcker mm -hmm. starts jacking up the interest rates to run down inflation. That creates a recession in 1980. That combines, of course, with the Iranian revolution, the overthrow of the Shah that produced lots of stagflation in 1980. And of course, what does Ronald Reagan do? Are you better off than you were four years ago? Well, no, you're not, because Jimmy Carter has appointed Paul Volcker chairman of the Federal Reserve and done very, very right-wing economic stuff. Well, vote for me, Ronald Reagan, and that will change somehow. So he comes in, and of course, he does an even more intense version of that. You get another recession in 81, 82, and Reagan ends up backing off and doing stimulus in 83 because the 82 midterms terrify him about what might happen to him in 84. But it's the policy in 81 to 82 that gets the credit for Morning of America, not the stimulus in 83 and the old-fashioned 70s Keynesianism in 83, right? But again, Carter does something right-wing, open space, right? In the 90s, Bill Clinton, he wants to have this big budget surplus, so he's mm -hmm. cutting, cutting spending, he's strangling the welfare state, right? 
And what does George Bush say we should do with that money? He says, let me give it back to you, the American people in a tax cut, uh, and then gives it all to rich people. He only has money to throw to rich people because Bill Clinton strangled the welfare state in the 90s. So opening, again, opening space for more right-wing stuff. And if you look at Barack Obama, by uh, doing sequestration in 2011, the Budget Control Act of 2011, strangling, uh, agreeing to strangle federal aid, that means that in all of these red states where the governors are cut and cut and cut and cut and cut, and there's no federal money to offset, which means in those rural communities, there's economic struggle. And who gets blamed for it? It's not the governor who gets blamed for it. It's the president who's a Democrat. So how do people respond to Barack Obama? They go to someone who goes, I'm going to pay attention to these forgotten communities that everyone has ignored and nobody's invested in, right? You open the door to more right-wing stuff. And on climate change for people who are uh, invested in that. Barack mm -hmm. Obama on fracking, by by supporting fracking, he collapsed oil prices all over the world because the Saudis responded to fracking by pumping so much oil out of the ground to try to shut down the American companies that the oil price collapsed. And then it collapsed again due to coronavirus even more. But it had already been cut in half even prior to that point because of fracking. And so what that means is that oil prices are now very, very low, and it's much harder for alternative energy to compete. And people blame Trump for pulling you know, energy incentives for, but it was Barack Obama who made oil dirt cheap by supporting fracking all throughout his presidency. So most of the time, these centrist Democrats, not only, you know, people argue, oh, I'd rather have a soft version of the left thing than a soft version of the right thing. No, you're getting a, a right wing thing and a right wing thing that will create the conditions under which more right wing things can happen. And often the Democrats will do something right wing that the Republicans would be too scared to do. Because when the Republicans try to do something really right wing, the Democrats oppose them and accuse mm -hmm. them of being heartless. But when the Democrats do something right wing, the Republicans don't oppose it. So the Democrats can do the most right wing stuff. Only Bill Clinton can do welfare reform. Reagan and Bush didn't do welfare reform. Reagan and Bush wouldn't have dreamed of trying that, right? Only Jimmy Carter could appoint Paul Volcker chairman of the Fed and jack the interest rate up to high heaven. Only he can get away with something like that. And of course, nobody's going to say in their platform when they're trying to get Democratic base voters to turn out for them that they're going to appoint Paul Volcker chairman of the Federal Reserve <laughs> or they're going to destroy welfare, right? Nobody says, I'm going to do sequestration. I'm going to let fracking happen all over the place. Nobody says these things. But that's what actually happens. And so when people come to this race looking at the platforms and comparing them and going, well, I want the soft Democrat thing, you're not getting the soft Democrat thing. You're getting something that is going to be on many issues worse than the Republican thing. You know, it was Barack Obama who bombed Libya and cut the GDP of that country in half and left that country still in a civil war to this day. And then Barack Obama mm -hmm. had the gall to blame David Cameron for it. This kind of stuff happens under these Democrats, and nobody talks about it because the Democrats, of course, they're not going to advertise to you and put it in their platform that this is what no. they want to do. You wouldn't show up if they did. It, you know what? Um, I I have to ask: Is Machiavelli a part of the the political theory that you've read? I've read Machiavelli, yeah, because you sound very Machiavellian, and what I mean by that is. I think the biggest issue is in, in all, everything you're describing is people are carried away by the, by the aesthetics. In fact, in Amharic, in Ethiopia, we have this saying, uh, which means rather than the quality of the food, we care about how your face looks or how you present it. And I think so many people are caught up in presentation in, like you said, explicit policy rather than the implicit policy. And the big kind of truth that Machiavelli uh, was aiming at is that people look, and, and James Burnham later uncovered this in his book, uh, The Machiavellians, is that people have this formal truth that they claim they're representing, but underneath it, it's totally different. It seems like you just do not take people at face value and you, <laughs> you look at what are the implicit things that they're actually doing. And, and I don't know what that is. You know, uh, too many people use matrix analogies with the red pills. And I don't know if that's a right analogy, but I just, I wonder what that is the ability 
to to see past the the charade to see uh you know the old man behind the curtain if we can have a wizard of oz reference uh what what is it that that is able to see that and another thing is you know i i mentioned the kind of the passion of your friend in in the debate that you two were having you have this utter calm about you uh, i don't know if other people have commented to you about that but you you're so utterly calm about it in the face of like you've said decades of of abuse uh and and a, a right wing slant. What what's interesting to me about this is, you know, I I wonder how how comfortable would you be in in seeing Democrats lose? Like, let's say uh, Trump wins in twenty twenty. We're filming this before the actual election. Uh, let let's say he wins. How many times would you be comfortable seeing the Democratic Party lose until? you get a real genuine left winger and and uh, just to give a little addendum to that the reason i ask is because on the state levels it seems you're very much about uh you know pragmatism in terms of switching parties contextually and all that but on the presidential level it seems that you're you're more uh about the actual um uh, you know the the ideology of the person running so that on the presidential level, it seems like the immediate consequences are less important, but on the state level, more important. And please correct me if I'm I'm wrong in, in kind of viewing that. Well, in the case of the states, if you are in the minority party in a state legislature, you really can do virtually nothing because mm -hmm. it's a legislative role. So I'm thinking mainly about state legislators in that case. The president, okay. of course, is going to be able to do some things regardless of what else is going on in the system and therefore will have relevance regardless of what else is going on. Uh, I, I would say with respect to the, the president, mm -hmm. there are cases under which you might consider, I'm not saying you should always vote Republican. So Nathan, in, in that talk, you <laughs> suggested I was saying always <laughs> vote for the Republican. Yeah. I'm not saying that. But it's worth uh, looking at the context of the specific race and the things that I look at. So a lot of people look at rhetoric. And we all started, at, everybody who follows this stuff closely started to doubt rhetoric and realize, oh, wait, politicians lie to us. So then it became all about policy. Everybody wanted to look at, well, what are they actually saying they'll do in terms of policy? But as it turns out, they can lie about policy too. They can. Uh, they can play all kinds of games with policy. In the Democratic primary, lots of Democrats said they supported Medicare for all and then fudged that or used qualifying language to try to slip stuff past people. And a lot of left-wing commentators didn't catch it or were slow, especially with Elizabeth Warren, very slow about Elizabeth Warren. I was under her from the beginning. I, I was not, so pro oh, props yeah. to you. Props to you oh, on that. She, oh yeah, she was playing games with Medicare for all right from the start. There are many paths. We could raise the age or lower the age. As soon as somebody says many paths, that's a clue word for, for that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, policy, you can't really trust policy. So what can you trust? Well, you have to look at what somebody has done. What have mm -hmm. they done previously when they've had power, had, had an opportunity to do something? Two, who are they getting money from? Who do they owe something to, right? Uh, because if you're taking money from people, there's going to be some kind of expectation and some threat of what happens if you don't have that money going forward into the future. And you, know, you also have to have to look at what might be motivating somebody to run. You know, do they have a realistic chance of winning? Are they running a self-promotion? There are things you can look at in terms of what's the material situation of the candidate? What incentives do they have based on where their support comes from? And what's their record? What have they done in the past? And with a lot of people, you don't even bother to explore the record. Like if you look at the confirmation hearing for Amy Coney Barrett, the Democrats mm -hmm. asked what she would do in all sorts of hypothetical situations, but they didn't really bother to explore what she had done. She had made lots of rulings. The principal reason they didn't like her is they didn't like those rulings theoretically, right? But they didn't bother to bring up rulings she'd previously had where she did make a ruling and could therefore be forced to justify it in the hearing. They didn't mm -hmm. talk about that because that requires doing a lot of homework and research on what people have done. And oftentimes it's hard to get that information, especially with local candidates, local races, state races. A lot of people don't have a lot of biography you can look into. They're new to politics. They've never run before. You don't have a lot of information. So you tend to go off 
of stuff like party, which is another reason why just running with the Democratic Party brand as a state legislature and as a state legislator in a red state is so unhelpful. Most people aren't going to look you up. They're not going to pay attention to how you're different from other Democrats. They're going to see that you're a Democrat. They're going to associate that with the National Democratic Party, which because they've been watching Fox for a while is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and they're going to vote against you on that basis. They're going to treat you as if you are Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, yeah. no matter what you do. Right. At the presidential level, we get to know these people very well because they've all had to be around for a while. They're all at least 35. They've all done something, something in their life. Uh, and they are going to have more of an impact. So it makes more sense to think about it a little differently in that context. Now, that being said, I'm, I'm definitely not saying always vote for the Republican. But the thing to do is if you because the Republicans do right wing stuff in a very visible way, People mm -hmm. get very worked up about right-wing stuff when a Republican is doing it, but they make excuses for it when a Democrat does it. If a yes. Republican had the corrupt kind of entanglement with Hunter Biden, if Donald Trump had a Hunter Biden type entanglement, the Democrats be talking about it all the time, like it's the tax returns or any of the other scandals they've tried to make into a big thing about the president. But because the Democrats doing it, let's make excuses for it. Barack mm -hmm. Obama destroyed Libya. But let's make excuses for him on foreign policy. And let's say that he's you know, really different from Bush and, and give him a Nobel Peace Prize. You know, everyone makes excuses for Democrats. But when a Republican does it, it's visible. So when the shit hits the fan, when a Republican is in office, when something really bad happens, then there's this big opportunity because everyone all of a sudden gets really upset with conservative stuff in general. Right. So in 2008, Barack Obama is able to take advantage of this by running a substan uh, no substance hope and change campaign. But that hope and change, change, change. That's what people wanted in 2008. That's an opportunity that you only get because of two terms of George W. Bush. Yeah. Two terms of being exhausted by him. If you look at the Bush approval rating, the bottom starts to fall out in 2005, about a year after that second election. After from 2005 on, everyone becomes acutely aware that this guy is really doing a bad job between Iraq, Katrina, the 2008 crash, everyone becomes very aware and everyone blames right-wing stuff because Bush is in office. If Kerry's in office, the Republicans say all the time that every Democrat is a socialist. If Kerry's in office, <laughs> Kerry is going to be the one who's at fault for Iraq because he wasn't insufficiently committed. If Bush had been in office, he would have finished the job, right? Kerry, you know, is, FEMA's probably not going to be better prepared for Katrina under Kerry than Bush. It, it strains the imagination to see how FEMA would be radically differently prepared, right? Mm -hmm. So he's going to get the blame for that. And then 2008, that has big, long range structural causes. That is not something that is just the Bush administration in the second term. So that's going to happen. And everyone's going to say it's because of socialist economics. Now, yeah. that's what happened in Britain. It happened that way in Britain because Gordon Brown, a labor prime minister, was in charge during 2008. And in Britain, everyone blames the Labor Party for spending too much money on social programs in the 2000s. That's what they think caused 2008. It's completely wrong, but that's what they believe. And the consequence in Britain was this sharp turn to the right, huge amounts of austerity, the NHS getting cut by a whole percentage point of GDP, huge, huge cuts, and then Brexit and Boris Johnson and much more agonistic politics, right? Imagine if the conservatives had won in 2005 in Britain. If the conservatives had won, their budget that they were calling for in their manifesto was basically the same, basically the same as the labor budget in 2005. They call, called for the same spending increases. There would have mm -hmm. been a whole different narrative, whole different narrative. It would have been about deregulation, about Thatcherism. It would have been a whole different narrative of the crash. But because they had Gordon Brown the left has gotten the blame and the left is may never recover in Britain yeah. or may not recover for a very long time. In the United States, we are blessed by John Kerry's defeat in 2004. Absolutely <laughs> blessed by it. It has done so many favors for us. And now people want to take another opportunity to potentially get that again. Another opportunity for a Republican to really exhaust this country and really tick this country off at right wing stuff. And then in 2024, you know, like D Donald Trump said, the, Re the Republicans could have run Abraham Lincoln in 2008. It would not matter. And conversely, the Democrats could have run Bernie Sanders in 2008 and won with him. In that moment, when the Republicans yeah. have completely exhausted us, you can run anybody and you can do anything. And it's a huge opportunity. Huge there opportunity. was Dennis Kucinich and Mike Gravel in, uh, mm -hmm. in uh, 2008. 
uh, I, th- those were who I was rooting for more back then. But uh, I was I was reluctantly supportive of uh, Obama. I was playing Nas's uh, "Black President" song on on the conservative campus, it was mm-hmm. which was very silent, and people uh, had not yet bought their flights to Canada like they said they were going to. Uh, but yeah, no, that that's really great. Just because you brought up the the British equation, it makes me wonder the the kind of process you said of blame on the Labour Party that you're talking about. Do you think that has any bearing on uh, the the recent you know uh, issue with Jeremy Corbyn and the accusations of of anti-Semitism? Well, on on anti-Semitism, I'll say this: Jeremy Corbyn certainly did not handle that issue in a very competent way. There are much better ways he could have handled that issue. The major mistake he made was he decided he wasn't going to do very much of any or about it. But mm-hmm. he decided to have an inquiry and try to make a show of doing something about it. That inquiry, of course, will then say he didn't do very much about it. Yeah. With a scandal, you either have to do nothing about it and try to make it go away by not talking about it and refusing to acknowledge it. You have to deny everything and just try to put it to bed. Or you have to be very open and say, this is, this is a problem. I'm going to fix it. And then you have to do something about it. And Jeremy Corbyn did not commit either way. He did a little bit of both. He started off trying to shut it down. And then when people gave him a hard time, he flipped from that strategy to trying to be open about it, which of course just reveals the ways he tried to shut it down. So a big <laughs> a big mess there in terms of his strategy. Now, of course, the British media, which is mostly owned by rich people, was very, very on this because they want to destroy a labor leader who is very heavily interested in redistributive programs relative mm-hmm. to most labor party leaders. In a similar way in the United States with the Bernie bro thing, everybody was uh, <laughs> in the media was looking to find a way to hurt Bernie Sanders. Uh, yeah. Anything, anything at all would get amplified. Anything critical or negative would get amplified. And so a lot of labor supporters, I think, are very angry at the British media for making that issue a priority issue and putting that ahead of healthcare, ahead of Brexit, ahead of the needs of ordinary people. But at the same time, Corbyn handled it very incompetently. So that's that's where I would come down on that. Corbyn could have done a much better job in just damage control on that scandal, just basic, basic political principles of damage control. Uh, and a lot of that comes from Jeremy Corbyn. I make a distinction between anti-imperialism and cautionism. Right. Mm-hmm. So two different ways of kind of framing left-wing foreign policy arguments. Anti-imperialism yeah. says we're a bad country, we're the bad guys, and we have to do obeisance to the people that we've hurt, right? And cautionism goes, we've blundered and made mistakes that aren't even good for us, right? Anything that we do that's really bad, you can frame it as we deliberately are evil, yes. or you can frame it as we're stupid and we screw up. Voters love we're stupid and we screw up. They love to say the elite is stupid, they're stupid, and they screwed up, and let's not vote for them because they're screw-ups who are getting people killed and wasting people's lives in foreign policy boondoggles. They're very receptive to that. They don't like the argument that their country is a fundamentally evil or bad country. And if you try to make that argument, you won't get anywhere. One of Corbyn's biggest weaknesses as labor leader was that he was too much of an anti-imperialist and not enough of a cautionist. So because Britain has a legacy of doing all kinds of terrible things in the Middle East, his attitude was, let's be very, very uh, apologetic to the Mm -hmm. people who are upset with us. And that looks to British people like support for uh, terrorist groups. It looks like you know, palling around with terrorists. It looks like supporting anti-Semites or being soft on anti-Semitism. All of these things come from this anti-imperialism, which paints Britain as the bad country, which has to atone, right? Countries aren't good or bad. Countries are powerful or weak. And powerful countries tend to do bad things to weaker countries historically. And unless you are really trying to avoid that, that's what tends to happen. Uh, So I say that the way to approach it is to go that these, these things that we've done, they were boondoggles. They were mistakes. They got a lot of people hurt. And they came from People being stupid, people imagining, like George W. Bush did, that he could bring democracy and peace to the Middle East, make mm-hmm. everybody's life better. He wanted to make everybody's life better. You don't have to make it about, oh, oil and power politics. I mean, that stuff comes into it. But also there was an ideology here of helping and making the world a better place. And it was a stupid ideology. And it was riddled with mistakes, riddled with mistakes. That's the way to oppose it that brings more people in. And one of the biggest weaknesses of the Corbyn leadership was this constant need to appear to be critical of Britain as a country morally rather than just the quality of the leadership. Lots of people would agree that Tony Blair's project of trying to make the Middle East a paradise was stupid and and ill thought out. 
but you don't have to frame Britain as an evil country to make that argument. Yeah, that that that's so funny. The um, economist and historian Murray Rothbard years ago, he asked this question in an article. He said, "Do you hate the state?" And I'll say on a personal level, this belies my bias. I I think I'm like Corbyn in the way that you described it. Personally, it's those arguments of of indignation or righteous anger regarding that foreign policy. Like it it drives me nuts. However, when you're talking about the kind of uh, bumbling bureaucratic mess of trying to uh, democratize the Middle East and, and and softening the kind of language and the blow, I could see how that's more effective for more people. That may be where I'm a odd man out and would have to learn more tact of of being more effective if it was the case that rather than just airing my emotions about these topics, I wanted to actually get the policy passed that would be contrary to that. And I could see now how in other, because I think in other issues, I may be more uh, interested in, in referring to the, um, you know, the good intentions, but the poor outcomes. But for whatever reason, on foreign policy, I'm a little bit more firebrand. And so that's a, that's a very yeah, interesting it's, it's the issue that catches a lot of people out. A lot of people are good on a lot of issues, but foreign policy, it's hard because so many people die. It's very horrible yeah. when we get it wrong on foreign policy. It's absolutely terrible. Really, 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 really bad. The Libyan thing with Obama, absolutely horrible, right? The thing is, George W. Bush had a 90% approval rating immediately after 9-11. Yeah. And people were calling French fries freedom fries because the French wouldn't participate. <laughs> they were flying Union Jacks in their, you know, on their yards because Tony Blair was supporting and everybody wanted to show how appreciative they were. So there were huge numbers of people who got emotionally invested in the project of the war on terror, huge numbers of people. And these people didn't do it because they're imperialists who want to dominate other people. That's not how they think. They thought they were really going to help. They bought mm -hmm. the ideological narrative of what it was. Yeah. And so for those people, they're not going to believe that they're bad people or evil people. And they don't want to believe that they were led into it by bad or evil people. They don't want to believe that they're stormtroopers and that Bush is Darth Vader. And people used to do these edits all the time where they'd make Dick Cheney look like Sidious and Bush look like Vader. Like, yeah. They don't want to believe that they followed Darth Vader. You're not going to convince people that they fell for that because they don't want to be convinced of that. That, that hurts to admit that you became part of something like that. So instead of that, just say, hey, you were lied to. You were duped by Bush and Cheney. They, lied, they withheld information. They uh, made stuff up and they tricked you. And let's be mad at them because they tricked good people into doing something horrible. Uh, that's a much more persuasive argument for the people who actually bought this. And those are the people you have to win over, not the people who have always been upset about it. Those people were upset about it from the beginning. I opposed Iraq from the beginning. I've always been upset about it. Yes, I can listen to an anti-imperialist imperialist argument, but it doesn't work as politics. Yeah. Shout out to Barbara Lee, a representative from California. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the only no vote uh, for the Iraq war. <laughs> um, it's amazing. I, I, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for the, the pragmatism, the functionality, the contextuality your level of comfort and uh, calm, <laughs> tranquility in the face of all of this uh, madness and chaos that people are, are trying to sift through. At, at this point, if there's if there's anything else you'd like to add that we didn't touch, please add it. And then also make sure we plug your, your website where people can read more of your writings and get more of, of these nuanced hot takes and uh, as well as anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the only thing I would add is that one of the reasons I can be calm about this is that I know our history. I, Because I started paying attention in 2000, I lived through the Bush administration. A lot of people my age were not politically paying attention during the Bush administration. And Trump is their first Republican, really, that they've really experienced, right? And if Trump is your first Republican, it's going to stress you out. But we do get through these people. They do terrible things. But if you look at Iraq, if you look at that kind of stuff, Trump hasn't done in Iraq yet. There are things that Bush did that were unfathomably bad that we haven't seen, uh, that we might see if we get Joe Biden because of the Democrats' record on foreign intervention. Uh, but if you look at our history, there have been terrible things constantly happening throughout our history. All the way back to the dawn of time, 
human beings have been doing terrible things to each other and we have got to oppose that stuff but if you get emotionally too charged up by the terrible things often that gets in the way of what you have to do to oppose those things effectively and your own emotional response becomes the enemy of your success and the enemy of stopping the terrible thing that we're trying to stop so for that reason that's why i i advocate calm and and chilling out it's hard to do because everybody the media is constantly trying to wind you up because that's how they sell content by people who are stressed out wanting to know what's going on because they're afraid so they sell fear they push it uh, but you gotta you gotta step back from it. it's very hard the television is the worst the tv media is the worst if you can get away from the tv media that will help a lot don't watch television news at all don't watch it at all don't watch clips of it don't watch late night talk shows all of that stuff is complete junk uh, have a nice diverse set of everything else but no television no television that's the worst part uh, if you want to feel calm that's uh, right that's what books. i'd say and uh books newspapers magazines you know you can read that stuff it's a little bit more distant when you're reading it it's nice to know what the people who are worked up are saying because you have to be able to think about their emotions but uh, have a little distance from it uh, read it don't watch it uh, don't listen to it don't listen to the the tone of the the voice uh, just read it from a distance and you'll start to see what it is emotionally and you'll start to have a little bit more ability to process. Uh, yeah, if you wanna read more of my stuff, you can find me at benjaminstudebaker.com, Studebaker, like the car, S-T-U-D-E-B-A-K-E-R. Uh, and, and that's really all I got. Perfect, thank you so much. Thanks.